gotten any message. Yeah. Yeah, they're coming. Hi, Michael. Welcome. We will give a couple of minutes for more people to join. That's fine. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the DGLS ITO DevOps webinar. We'll just wait a few minutes so more people have an opportunity to join. Hello. Hi. more people are joining us today in our webinar welcome everybody uh we'll just give it a few more minutes it's just one last one uh, <laughs> so hi anthony hi ashton hi steven Um, we're expecting for this webinar around um, 60 people. So let's see how many are being able to make it. In the meantime, I'm happy to give you the um, housekeeping notes for today. So this is a webinar format, so you will be able to see our trainer, Edvinda, you'll be able to see her slides. And if you hover your mouse on the bottom, you'll be able to see the chat where we've been saying hello to everybody and you will be able to see the Q&A Q box. I highly encourage everybody to put their questions throughout the session on the Q&A box, because this way, when we are sharing the recordings of the, when we share the, the recordings with you all, you'll be able to get the responses as well. And also it allows it Vinda some time should she's unable to answer all the questions during the session. Okay, so you guys will all be in a position to receive the responses. Uh, the recordings will be available we will be uploading the recordings on our YouTube channel, DDLS. So you will receive um, an email when the recording is ready. Um, is there any more questions than anyone wants to ask me now? You're welcome to put them through the chat. Nope, not a problem. So, um, so we'll get started then. If you know what you think. Yep, I think yep. we should. Okay, so, um, welcome everybody to the RTO DevOps webinar. Uh, my name is Fernanda. I work at the marketing team of DDLS. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you to Itvinda Mankum. Itvinda has been with us since 2000, and she has over 25 years commercial industry experience. She's one of our highly regarded trainers and with an extensive experience in computer support and in managing projects on a range of scales. So, um, 
you you see her caliber. She's amazing and she's one of our dearest um, staff members in the Brisbane office, hence you have her Brisbane background <laughs> at the back. So with no more to say and no more questions, um, I'll leave you with Vinda. All right, thanks, Fernanda, and I will take over now. Um, okay, well, welcome, everyone. Um, as Fernanda said, my name is Itvinda. Um, I did start off with a background as a Microsoft certified trainer, but now I'm mainly a process trainer, um, and, and particularly an ITIL for managing professional. Um, and with extensive knowledge of DevOps, um, Agile service management, Agile process ownership, and DevSecOps, as well as SRE. With that slight background of ITIL 3 as well, because that's what led me to this road. So this is me, and I'm just going to shut this window because someone decided to cut my graph. I apologize for that. Okay, so what we are going to look at today is how ITIL works. So we're going to gain a perspective on ITIL. We're going to gain a perspective of DevOps. And then just so you can so you understand that they do actually work together. Um, a lot of people seem to think it's contrary, but it's not. It, they do actually work together and they work really well. Um, so let's start off by looking at what we're going to look at. So just some ITIL for basics, some DevOps basics, and then the two together. And then what you can do if you want to do the certifications. So I'll, I'll, I'll just run you through what offerings ITIL has and then the offerings from DevOps and where you can go and look for these. So let's begin. And I will be using uh, my trusty pen to write on the screen to highlight things. I may draw additional diagrams as well, but it will all be on screen just to help you along. Um, so I'm going to really start off with ITIL. Now, one of the things about ITIL is it is the most widely recognized and accepted frameworks. Um, and it has been because ITIL has been around since 1989, which is quite a long time ago for some of us. Um, but it started off as something that the Treasury Office in the UK or the Cabinet Office, as they were also called, in the UK decided was important because IT was starting to become mainframe and there needed to be a way to ensure that everything had a structure to it and a process to it. So they came up with some manuals, some guidance. And we always, I always like to say that ITIL is nothing else but a framework which offers guidance. And the reason why, why it's just a framework is that sometimes we find that things work and we don't want to break them, but we may choose to develop further by looking at the framework and the guidance it offers us to improve what we've got. And really that's what the key of ITIL4 is. And there is a big push now on this topic at the bottom they're called continual improvement. So we're always going to be looking at what we have and find ways of getting better and better. So it is, like I said, the most widely recognized and accepted framework for IT service management. Um, so the key features of this is the fact that it has something called a service value system, 
because the key thing there is to provide value. So whatever we do, we are focused on providing value, but we're also looking at something called the holistic integration of the four dimensions of service management, which is often seen as the foundation of ITIL. So moving on to this next slide, the four dimensions actually consists of organizations and people, information and technology, partners and suppliers, value streams and processes. And the idea is that you have the service value system generating the products and services to produce the value at the end of it. So we are now moving away from what we had that traditional model of delivering solutions to service management to delivering business value. We're always going to be considered the value component. And the key thing there is with value, if I'm pointing the finger at you, then I'm also pointing finger at myself. If I'm creating value for you, then I'm also creating value for myself. Um, so what you have to consider is who your stakeholders are. And your stakeholders are always going to be those people that have a stake in whatever it is you're doing. So whether you're an investor, whether you're a customer, whether you're the user, whether you're a shareholder, you have a stake and you want that value. And we use these techniques now put together to create value. So the service value system in itself is about how we cooperate together and facilitate that value and produce those IT enabled services. Now, we all know there isn't anything in this world that we do now that doesn't have some form of IT in the background. Uh, whether you're running your air conditioning system, whether you're running a smart fridge or your smart TV, there's an IT system running behind it. And closely followed with that is an app. So this is the key thing that we're going to use these tools that we have to put together value so that at the end of the day, everyone's happy. So looking at the next slide. So the key thing we're going to be looking at is that we are looking at the four dimensions. And I always like to draw the four dimensions like this. I always start off by saying, well, we've got guiding principles. Now, the guiding principles are key. There's seven guiding principles. Focus on value. Start where you are. Progress iteratively with feedback. Collaborate and promote visibility. Think and work holistically. Collaborate and promote visibility. Keep it simple and practical and optimize and automate. So we've got guiding principles. We've got the organization's governance. This is how an, an organization looks after itself with its own procedures and policies and polices itself. Then we have what we call the service value chain, which is the very heart, the very engine, which has the activities we have to perform from going from something what we'd call a demand to creating that value. We have practices and we have 34 practices which assist the activities of the service value chain, convert the demand to value. And then we're always going to be looking for continual improvement opportunities. I see that as a diamond, but to make it work really well, we need to make sure that the foundation is good, which is the four dimensions. We have the organizations and people, which is where we ensure that we have the right people in the right roles. We have the right information and technology infrastructures. We have the correct relationships with our partners, vendors, and our suppliers as well as making sure that anything we do, we have an excellent value stream with the attached processes as well. So those are the four dimensions and this is how they work together. The whole system's been designed in a way that we are no longer working in silos. When we work in silos, 
we tend to work for the silo. So whether that silo is about strategy or design or transition or operations, we're just working for the silo. Take away the silos and put all those people together. They need to work together and share information to the highest degree possible. So this will create that collaboration and transparency that we want. So we don't want to work in silos anymore, but work in what we call multidisciplinary teams. And often that's where some of the other frameworks, typically are agile being one of them, would come in where we have those scrums and people share information and work together. The key thing there is that we have this renewed focus on this value-driven customer focus because ultimately that multidisciplinary team is looking at value for the customer. We're no longer looking at how we are performing within the team. There is that specific push for whatever value we create or can we make it better? So what we're also doing is we want to co-create value with our customers so that our customers keep coming back to us. So we may do that by talking to the customers, sending them surveys, asking them their opinions. We may use them as valued customers in the way that we might try new things out with them and so on. So this is how we have this specific way of trying to align and re realign our products and service to meet the goals and visions of what is required. Why ITIL? It is not only about our external customers, it's our internal customers as well. So remember, you're supporting your own guys as well. It is a digital transformation journey. Value, the definition is always going to be a bit strange because it's perceived benefits and importance of something. When it's perceptions, it's always going to be subjective. So when you look typically at any ads, you'll notice how an ad will have things on it stating well, it can do this, it can do this, it can do this, because it's trying to meet the perceptions of the different people that might want to purchase that product. So the idea then is that we are learning, collaborating, focusing and innovating. So we're always, always ensuring that we're giving, if giving people what they want and we're in and then co-creating value for everyone the organization and the customers that we serve as well. So with that, I won't go into idle in too much detail. I can spend days on it, um, but let's look at some of the DevOps stuff. Um, so if we're looking at the DevOps basics here. And with the DevOps basics, very interesting, DevOps. And I start off with what DevOps is not. It's not a technique or a methodology. There's no methods. There's no frameworks. It's not a product or a vendor. And it's not a replacement or a competitor for any of these, whether, whether you're doing project management or ITIL or Scrum, it's not there to do that. What it is, is a collective body of knowledge. We call it a CBOC. And being a CBOC, it means, well, that means we're scattered. We've got everything everywhere. Um, and the DevOps Institute is perhaps the best location to go and search out all the different types of collective knowledge that they have. Um, they do have a handbook, but the handbook is just case studies of how they've made DevOps work well in certain organizations. Typically, my favorite is actually the Phoenix Project. And if anyone hasn't come across it, it's a novel. It's very easy to read and it's funny. And it gives you a good concept of what DevOps is or how it's meant to work. I um, mean, a follow-up novel that 
unicorn project has also been created. But what we what they have done is they've created this collection via blogs. They have the cons. They have DevOps days. Um, so you have all these various ways to actually put things in. And I always see DevOps as something quite organic as it's always growing and changing. So being part of the Institute is a good idea. It is really a key to have rapidly integrated teams where we're using business functions, tools, and systems. And a culture of new ways of working, collaborating, improving, and continuous learning. We are always going to say the job never gets done. Because we will plan something, we'll design it, we'll build it, we'll test it, we'll release it, deploy it, operate it, monitor it, start again. So each one of these will be an increment. So we're adding to the product as we're going along. So we need to look at this as a new way of working, a new way of collaborating. And if anyone hasn't read the two books, I seriously recommend them. They're, they're hilarious. And you might even recognize yourself in there. This is how old IT used to be. Old IT was developers developed and they did their bit. They coded and they built, and then they handed it off to the test team. Who did their bit? They handed it off to the release team. Who did their bit? And they handed it off to the operations team. But what we have here is separate areas. So what we're saying here is, no one is talking to each other. The new approach now is shift left. Let's start off all of us working together, the security team, the ops team, the release team, the quality team, all working together so that product we create already has those features to start off with. So we're considering that at that time. So particularly when it comes to security, security often can be probably the, the worst part because they hold things back because things need to change. And that way, time passes by and your project time lengthens. So we don't want that anymore. We start off by breaking things down into minimum viable products. And we focus on value on each increment that we want to create and ensure that all of those are included. On the next slide, you can actually see how we have put it together. So new IT is about having a cross-functional team. So it's the best of agile, idle, and lean. We put things together. We code it with the mind of everyone else. We build it, we test it, but we're all contributing. When we work with these teams, we have teams that have a broad knowledge of the business. And we also have an in-depth knowledge of the subject areas expertise but they're all working together. And what often happens in teams like that, they absorb each other's information. So if one is sick, they can carry on working because they understand what's going, because there is more cooperation and more like, I like to say collaboration, because we're all aiming for the same end, not for, well, I'm a good good coder or I'm a good builder or I'm a good, I'm good at security. Um, it's like, how can we use my skills to make it better? So when we collaborate together, we create more value for the products or services end users. 
And we're always, always looking to continually improve. So let's look at now how we can, how these two work together. Firstly, I'd just like to point out that we do have organizations that work, work with these products. We have um, PeopleSet who work on behalf of ITIL. In fact, PeopleSet own Axelos now, and they're the ones that produce the ITIL manuals. Now, ITIL is perhaps the only guidance that has got written down frameworks, and they all work together really well. And then we have the DevOps Institute on the other side. Now, there are other flavors of DevOps, and there's nothing wrong with those. They all work together in the same kind of way. Um, we particularly have been working with the DevOps Institute for a long while. So there are all the different flavors and things that come out of DevOps. So when we look at it together, and it has always been thought of as, oh, well, DevOps and ITIL, they're two different things. They're different philosophies. Actually, they, they're not. They support each other. And ITIL itself has adopted some of the DevOps ways of thinking, which is actually very evident in those guiding principles. So remember I said the first guiding principle, which is focus on value, which is where both ITIL and DevOps are interested in considering the customer achieving value. So it is about who is achieving this value. It's the customer. We also have the next guiding principle in ITIL, which is progress iteratively with feedback. So this is breaking it down into small chunks. I mean, it's kind of like saying, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So let's break things down into small chunks so that each chunk is valued and we focus on small chunks. So we work in an agile method of working. We might use a backlog system where we will create a sprint, run the sprint, do a daily sprint, uh, scrum, sorry, uh, create the increment, do our retros and reviews, and then do our next sprint. So this backlog is your prioritized backlog. And hopefully we create these components with that sharp focus as required. So that's the idea is that we have the feedback that we get for improvement before we move to the next chunk. We're not going to start something new until we're happy with that first chunk. And then we'll do the next chunk in the same way, and the next chunk, and the next chunk. But what we do need to be aware of here is that when we're getting feedback, we're getting feedback for everything. We need to ensure that just because we've added this chunk, this chunk's not stopped working. It still needs to work and it goes on. We also need to think and work holistically. And this is largely ensuring that we have those four dimensions in place, our organizations and people, our information and technology, our partners and suppliers, and then having that value streams and processes set right to. So the value streams and processes are akin to a workflow of how we plan to do the work that we do. That is more about that journey through that service value chain, which is the very heart of the service value system in ITIL. And then we have optimizing and automating. And this is an interesting concept. And this actually comes from site reliability engineering, where we look at getting rid of what we call toil. Toil is rep repetitive tasks that we have to do that will be mundane and often meaningless, but also stopping us doing new things. And if we can actually look at the toil, and it might not be all the toil that we do, we might find that some things cannot be automated or should not be automated, but whatever we can, we should automate it. 
get rid of that repetitive manual work by making sure that we're able to automate. This will actually add resilience because automation is not going to make mistakes, uh, less error prone work, more productivity. Um, there is another guiding principle just before that, keep it simple and practical, which means we actually ensure that we have simplified things before we optimize and automate them as well. So it's really important that we actually look at everything we do and see if we can't break it down. Because if we can automate things, then we can free up our humans to do other things. And with those other things, they might be doing new projects, they'd be doing the things that they've been meaning to do for a while and they haven't done it. And that's the two working together in that sense. So the idea is that we want to create and increase the value. So don't wait to be asked to be proactive, get involved. It is time for DevOps to unite into DevOps. And I, I, funnily enough, I've seen a practical accidental way with that happen. I did some delivery of some ITIL training to a health department in Wellington in New Zealand. And they, they said that we had a flood and we had to put our devs in with our ops. Um, far from it being a really poor experience, turned out to be a really good experience because they started to talk to each other. Productivity went up because when devs were doing things, they were talking to the ops guys and they were asking them questions about, you know, can we put this in now and how will it impact other things? So because they were working together, they got better traction. So they were actually getting better at what they're doing. So they weren't adversely impacting the organization and they were increasing their resilience to technology. So that was just a great example. You can also look at your ITIL practices. Now it's interesting in ITIL 3, practices got called processes and functions. And sometimes it was hard to think about what was what's a process, what's a function. They now use this umbrella term called practices, which is the humans, the tools, the functions, the processes, etc. So it's everything they call it a practice, whether it's incident management, change management, problem management. So what we now need to do is we need to look at those practices through the DevOps lens and see what fits and what does not. Look at where we've got duplicated effort or any conflicts. Look at areas that can work together. For instance, like when we, when we want to create a new product, we need to make sure that we're not only just talking to the people who are gonna develop it, but the people who are gonna use it, which are our customers. The customers will always have requirements that they are responsible for their outcomes. So we need to consider those. Um, we want to look at how it will have either both dev and ops. So we want to recognize that dev and ops are complementary and they don't fight against each other. We also need to ensure that we agree on metrics. Metrics is a very important concept because Key thing here is if you can't measure it, we can't improve it. So we need to know what our baselines are. So that when we get here to that new improved status, we know that that is an improvement. And you know, improvement doesn't have to be a big thing or a big change of the product. It might be you can do things a lot quicker or people are responding to things a lot quicker. So, we don't want those dev and ops silos. We don't want those disparate set of metrics that they each view in different ways. We want to create some common ground so we can make it easy to cooperate, which very likely will help improve business value and what the business wants and needs.
So how do we make it better? Get rid of your barriers, organizational barriers. So whether it's accidentally putting them into the same team or putting them in the same teams or creating those multidisciplinary projects so that people work together so that they've got better communication, more collaboration. Collaboration will lead to trust and hopefully they'll all be accountable. So it's not going to be anyone's fault. One of the things that is encouraged in this culture is that we have a safety culture. So that two things, people are able to try out new things. And the second thing, people are able to work together in, in a way that they're getting better feedback from each other. So if they do make mistakes, it's not a mistake. It's something we learn from and we will move away from it by having a blameless post-mortem about it. This has happened. This is why it happened. We won't do it again. Let's move on. We don't dwell on it and we don't blame anyone. It's, it is the team's issue. It's not the individual's issue here. We want to ensure better service design by ensuring everyone contributes so that we're co-creating value from the customer to the DevOps person and beyond. We're looking at improving change and release capabilities. There's this push to move away from that traditional cab model, automizing simple things. Um, going for what they call peer-to-peer -peer authorization. Because we're working in this digitally diverse environment, it is important to consider that we want to move on really fast. And we don't have time for CAB. CAB might run twice a week or it might run once a week and we don't want to wait for that. So if we have peer-to-peer -peer authorization where we have subject matter experts authorizing a change as required and then maybe doing a retro cab on it to ensure that it has followed the proper processes for for approval as well make sure that you're embracing automation so in devops one of the key things is that we're doing ci cd ci cd is continual integration continuous deployment and the key thing there is that we keep doing it and we never stop. So again, that whole idea of having that infinite loop is actually, that's what we look, we're talking about with dev and ops working together. Make sure you have your metrics because that is gonna be a proof of success. So they are not incompatible. They are different in scope, but use them as complementary. Use the ITIL 7 guiding principle approaches to complement DevOps and focus on customer value. Ensure automation and have an end-to-end -end approach of the service lifecycle plus integration of product and service management practices. So this is how it can work. And it's about having this creating now a culture in your organization where we're looking at sharing and collaborating together to the highest degree possible so that there's no hidden agendas, no keeping information from other people, but moving together really well. To take this further, we have a whole draft of certifications. And I can start off firstly with the ITIL certification. So the ITIL board does have a library which has valuable guidance. And I always like to say to people, it is guidance. It's not prescribed and it's not mandatory. It's to help organizations be the best and thrive in this digitally diverse transform transformed world that we have. So we have the foundation course, which is a three-day course. Um, and there's an, obviously an exam. All of these have an exam that follows. 
So this is actually a really good overview on everything and, and the new acronyms that you might pick up. Then we have the specialist courses, create, deliver and support. This one is particularly about, if we're talking about the guiding principles, so guiding uh, the service value system, service value chain, practices and CI, this is particularly about the service value chain. It's how we use the activities in the service value chain effectively to create good products. Um, and there's an exam for that. And then we have the ITIL specialist drive stakeholder value, which is looking at the product from value pers perspective for the stakeholders and how we extract what people want and give, give it to them. And we have high velocity IT. This is perhaps my, my most favorite course. They both obviously both have exams as well. Um, this is my favorite course because this does look at how DevOps, Lean, Agile, and the other frameworks fit into ITIL as well. So it's um, that's why it's called high velocity. It is essentially a kind of DevOps version of ITIL. And there's an exam for that one. And then we have, for those of you who might be into risk management and governance, we have direct plan and improve. And then once you've done the exam for those four, you can then do the managing professional exam. And on the other side, we also have the leader. We have the DPI again, which is the bridging course for the two. And then there is the leader course, which is for anyone who's leading ITIL teams or leading it in their organization. So you're looking at using up your ITIL and digital strategy in, in the correct manner. And then passing that exam will allow you to do the strategic leader exam. And then of course you have the master, which is ultimately going to be a bit of a thesis to write about a project that you might have been involved with or run. So that is the ITIL certifications. And then we have the DevOps certification and we have the foundation one. Um, I deliberately haven't put all of them because we also have all the other DevOps Uh, certification, then I'm just going to bring up the web page so that you can all see it as well. And I just want to share that with you. So you can see that these are the many certifications that you can do. And um, there's the foundation, there's the leader, there's the engineering one. That is um, what was called the CICD course. They've renamed it to the engineering foundation course. Um, anyone who's done the AZ400 Microsoft course will be familiar with that. Um, we have DevSecOps, we have the DevSecOps practitioner, uh, continuous delivery ecosystem, there's a foundation and then there's the testing. So they've, they've actually gone off in this wrap, site reliability, um, certified agile service manager, and then there's the manual or uh, the value stream management foundation course. So you can actually get yourself certified in these different courses. Just be aware that all these courses, even the engineering ones are just process based courses. So there won't be any coding involved in that. This is just how to make sure you have the correct processes around it. So if you go on to any of these, you will hopefully be able to see what I can see in a second is what you can do and then download the blueprint as well. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I will now come back to my slide. So.
so you get an idea of what is available and what isn't. So typically in the foundation course, you learn about the culture, automation, which is important, being lean, being measurable, sharing. So it's telling you all those collaborative things. Talk about the three ways of DevOps, which is flow, feedback, continuous improvement, which involves experimenting and learning, the organization. So how people work in organizations, how people talk to each other, how people share information, how they should do it and how they shouldn't do it. Um, benefits, principles and practices, and then all the other frameworks as well. So that is that. Now, um, Fernanda, if you're around, we can look at those questions and answers. Let me have a look and see. Um, I am sure that those slides will be available to you for um, for for viewing later on. So I'll ensure that Fernanda actually does that. Does anyone else have any other questions? What is to stop an MDT becoming a, another silo? What is to stop it is actually ensuring everyone understands what the culture is, because you will probably end up, um, Anthony, making sure that the team that works understands why they're working together and not being siloed. So you're not, you're not going to have permanent teams. You're going to have a team that works on component or a part or a product or a service and they work for it without becoming a silo I have come across where people say oh well we just hand things over to the DevOps team that has created silos but that's those people not approaching this in a correct manner any other questions guys If you do have any questions, feel free to email Fernanda. I'm sure she will pass them along to me so I can answer them if anything, anyone, anyone think retrospectively. Other than that, that is the end. Um, and please feel free and please go to our website, check out the courses and look forward to seeing you on one of my courses. Thank you very much.